ko te huri atu ra tātou ki tēnei, uh, ki tēnei anō o ngā taumata, ko te taumata tua toru mō tēnei wā. Uh, we come now to our third panel discussion e te iwi. Uh, hei kaua i a tātou ki te āpōpō. Uh, our third panel discussion uh, leading into the future. And um, I would like to welcome this panel's chair, uh, Victoria Rhodes Carwin. Uh, who will be uh, the, the chair for our third panel. And thank you, Victoria. Uh, Victoria uh, leads the Aotearoa Youth Declaration Conference, uh, bringing together hundreds of rangatahi to create youth declaration, create the youth de declaration policy document. Uh, and apologies for these bios. I didn't write them, by the way. So if they're, if they're bringing you grief, I, I do apologize. Uh, through this kaupapa, she advocates for youth involvement in decision-making, uh, campaigns on issues uh, young people care about, and supports rangatahi to engage with their local leaders. She has been active in the environmental space along with, uh, alongside Blake, uh, the Sir Peter Blake Trust, and recently returned from the COP24 uh, in Poland last year. She is in her final year at Victoria University of Wellington, studying environmental studies, development studies, and politics. Homo te paki paki moto tato kai hotu, Victoria Rhodes Kahn. Tina Koto e tina ata ko mawa tu ko maunga ko wairoa tu ko awa ko naturangi tu ko iwi e tipu aku akiao e papa moa. E noho ana anai nei e te whanganui a tāra ko Victoria Rhodes Carlin tuku ingoa. Uh, thank you for the wonderful opportunity to talk to you today about leading into the future. And having been involved in a range of organisations in the youth development space, civic space and, and different environmental organisations, I'm never too far from the phrase, young people are the leaders of tomorrow. And it's meant to be an empowering and supportive phrase, yet the more I hear it, the more it sounds like an excuse. An excuse for to not let young people be the leaders of today. And in the context of leading into the future, I believe the question is not how do we empower young people to be the leaders of tomorrow, but how do we empower them to be the leaders of today and meaningfully involve them in our decision-making processes. A young leader I know, uh, Freya Cook from Wellington, she's 17, um, she spoke about this in a speech at Parliament a few weeks ago, saying that because if we are the future, we are not of concern right now. We are not of importance right now, and we are not listened to to today. We don't live in a bubble for 18 years of our lives, unaffected by New Zealand's issues, until we're able to have our democratic say in them. We are not suffering from mental health, climate change, and poverty, and racism in the future. We're suffering right now. Rangatahi are passionate, motivated, and eager to be involved in the decisions that affect their lives. And many are already leaders in these areas. My friend Sophie is a very clear example. Um, there's leaders in the climate movements, leaders in the mental health movements, and Tino Rangatiratanga. They're not waiting for permission to be at the decision-making table. They're not waiting to be invited to be a part of those um, important discussions that affect their lives. They're stepping up and doing it themselves. Young people want to have a say in their future, and it's incredibly important that they do. Not, not only strengthens the decision-making process, but strengthens the outcomes. But how do we empower rangatahi to be at that table, and how do we remove the barriers to allow them to be there? For the past three years, I have been leading the Aotearoa Youth Declaration Conference, whereas this year we brought 350 rangatahi from across the country for the conference in Auckland in April, where they spent four days identifying the biggest issues in our society and coming up with tangible policy solutions to them, creating the Youth Declaration document. And, and similar to the People's Report, it's a document outlining a youth vision for Aotearoa, an ideal world that, that these young people want to live in. And the three core issues that they identified are mental health, climate change, and inequality. And it's important to understand the context to which young people live in, what it's like to be a young person in 2019, to be a young person in the 21st century. I found out recently that the most lonely group in our society are young people between 16 and 24. 
In an increasingly connected world, we are increasingly isolated from each other. So in leading into the future, how do we tackle these challenges, understand the context to which young people live in? We've grown up with the existential crisis of climate change and watched year after year our leaders and global leaders do nothing. We've grown up in the mental health crisis where it is a defining characteristic of our lives. And we've grown up seeing the increasing gaps between us, marginalising our friends and oppressing others. Young people have increasingly complex, complex, complex lives um, and we need to tailor our meaningful involvement, our inclusion, to understand that. Rangatahi need to be at that table, but we also need to understand how we can remove our own barriers to bring them there. And we can discuss that today, um, ask those hard questions, but um, we've got some amazing rangatahi on the panel, so please use this as an opportunity to, to take notes and, and really take some information forward. Um, not just learning, but actually having like a step-by-step -step process as to how you can improve your engagement with rangatahi. Kia ora and thank you. Tēnā koe, Victoria. Uh, e kranga tuna rā ki ngā kai noho ki runga i tēnei taumata. It's our privilege um, and our pleasure to invite uh, Kate Boylan, Waimirirangi Kōpū Stone and Tamoko Ormsby, uh, uh, Dewey Sakayan uh, and uh, Whale Andrew Lesser. And we will read their bios uh, because these fellows are just awesome. So. It's, it's necessary for us to hear of their brilliance. Uh, Kate is a sustainability engineer at Tonkin and Taylor and was recently named Future Thinker of the Year by the New Zealand Green Building Council. She is a member of the Social Engineering Advisory Team and founder of, Ka of the Kākāriki Team to encourage colleagues to be more conscious of their impact on the environment. Kate sits on the board of the Now Crowd a young professionals network for entrepreneurs who, who want to drive positive change within their organisations. She also runs a social media challenge, channel called Kiwi Gals Says Reduce, uh, aimed at uh, educating family, friends and followers about how to lead a sustainable lifestyle. Kia ora everyone. I want to start off with a quick confession. I think I might have an obsession with hats. I have a bunch of different ones. Sometimes I feel like I'm drawn to them. I just happen upon them, or they find me, like I'm a hat magnet. I guess one could say that these are the hats that got me here today. Oh, do I have slides? There, there. My name is Kate Boylan, and I am a sustainability engineer at Tonkin and Taylor. I am also a minimizing waste advocate, or as my friends would lovingly describe me as a tree hugger, hippie, the annoying flatmate who always makes me compost, or eco-warrior princess. That last one's my favorite. Those names might sound mocking, but I know that deep, deep down, that they know what I preach is important, and I know they're learning and making changes. I graduated from the University of Auckland in 2015 with an honors in mechanical engineering. I worked as a mechanical services engineer in the building industry for a few years before making the leap to a career that aligns more closely with my personal values and passions. I work on a range of projects within Tonkin and Taylor across the broad spectrum of sustainability and resilience. Earlier this year, as mentioned, I was lucky enough to be named the New Zealand Green Building Council Future Thinker of the Year. So thank you, as always, to the Green Building Council for the honour and for giving me such an amazing platform. Today I feel so privileged to be on such a bright, diverse and talented panel. To be honest, when I was doing my background research, or stalking, who's judging, and to my fellow change-making panellists, I felt incredibly humbled. The goal of this session is to explore how we can empower strong youth voices, and I think this panel itself is a brilliant step in the right direction. 
we must give voices, these voices a platform. After all, it is diversity and its inclusion. Last week, I was in a similar position, representing the youth voice at the SBN conference about the end of plastics as we know it. And in this team, there were some high school students, just 13 and 14 years old. Thinking and working alongside them, I realized that even their perspective was often in complete contrast to my own. Some could call it naivety, inexperience, or ignorance, but I thought it was profound. They were brave enough to ask those seemingly silly questions and challenge the status quo that even after a few years in the industry, I had become accustomed and complacent to. We must give those voices a platform. I recently heard about a company who is one position on the board specifically for a millennial or someone from the younger generation of their workforce. This role could help challenge those ingrained old ways of doing things and the, all the common excuses used to not do things by bringing a fresh perspective to the table. Perhaps this should be an idea adopted by more businesses moving forward. After all, it's diversity and it's inclusion. One of the first questions asked in the panels today was what can our rangatahi do to help? And the response was do something. Simple but perfect. I agree that we have a huge role in communicating and advocating for the SDGs. Following that recommendation, and you're going to roll your eyes and call me a millennial here, but I put up a poll on my social media page asking my followers if they knew what the SDGs were, thinking they all would. And I'm currently sitting at 50%, so I know I've got some work to do. Social media gets a bad rep, but I think it should instead be utilized as the incredible communication tool it has the power to be. Let's use it as a tool for good, a tool for driving positive change. Every day I am motivated and committed to creating a better, more sustainable planet for the sake of humankind and future generations because we do not have another option. I am motivated and committed because I believe this is a challenge that we can rise up to and solve together. Nā mihi. We thought it a good idea to read their bios as we call each of them to the podium just so you can have fresh in your mind the areas of expertise. Kanga tēnei kia kōrua, wai mirirangi, e tāmoko, e oku hoa, nau mai hoki mai ki te enei whare oro oro tonu rā i o koutou i o kōrua takahanga. Nō ere nau mai hoki mai e o takahanga. Nō ere nau mai hoki mai e oku hoa. Wai mirirangi Kōpū Stone and Tāmoko Ormsby are the founders of uh, pipiri kia papa tuanuku. It is a social movement aimed at raising more awareness around the current state of our taiao, our environment, and its impact on our pepeha and essentially our identity. Uh, the initiative engages people to make environmentally sustainable choices in their everyday lives. Te nā kōrui o kuhua. Pahiretia <laughs> Motemininane. 
ahua tanga kia whakahāngai i te panoni tanga o te ahua rangi ki te ahurea Māori. Nā kona i tīmatai māua i te kaupapa a pipiri kia papa tuanu ki kia whakamārama mai, pipiri, koi a te mārama tua ono o te tau, te wāhanga o Matariki, te wāhanga kia piri tahi ai tātou, kia tātou anō, anō hoki kia piri ai tātou, kia papa tuanu ki. Papa tuanu ki, kia tiro pērā tu ki āia anō nei he whaia. I te mea, e whakaoro o te Māori ko te whakapapa, a i heke mai mātou, mai āia, ko rangi nui e tui honei ko papa tuanu ki e takutoa ki. Takotoa kenei. Nā reira, koe rā tā māua i ingana te whakaharā ke i tēnei ngākau ki roto i o mātou hoa. Me pewhea e whakakohi a rātou ki roto ki raro i tēnei tuanui, kia whakaaro matua ki ngā taiao, mā te kitenga kotahi, mā te whakapapa, mā te mana ake o te tangata, kia kaua o waiho mā te kāwana, mā te kaunihera rāno, mā e nei rautaki mātou e whakaora, mā ku ake, mā te tangata ake. Nā reira, i whātu i etehi kōwhiringa ki a rātou, kia whakakore i ngā kirihau o roto i oranga, whakakore i ngā miti e pākino nei ki ngā wāwā o waikato, me e rā momo āhua tanga. Mā te kotahi o e rā kōwhiringa, me ki rā te kōrero, ki te moimoi a ahau, ka tāia e au, ki te moimoi a tātou, ka tāia e tātou. Nā, koe rā te ia o tā kau tamā o kaupapa a pipiri kia papa tuanu ki. I, au e, mahu e mai au te takina ko ai au, ko tāmo ko omsi a hau, he tanifa o waikato, he pāpaka o rangataua, he kāwaua mani o poto, tēnei mākue ko orero mō te reka o tēnei kūmara, he wai nō ngā mōte mō anō mōkau, nō ngā wai mata mata o hāparapara, nō te awahau o ihinga, nō waikato tai, waikato tanifarau e nei mokopuna e wai o rai. He aha hei koke ngā ki mua, i tēnei wā, ko tēnei, e noho ana ki te poari wete wete i te whakarewa tanga o te Andrew, ki roto ki tēnei ao, e whakahono i te taketake tanga me te tai ao ki roto ki o mātou hapa. Nō reira, mena kaore koe i mārama, whai atu i tētehi kai kōrero Māori i roto i tēnei kaupapa mahuru Māori, koe ra tētehi o mate, kaora te reo Māori, kaora te reo o te tai ao, kaora tātou katoa. Nā reira, kaoti ki tēnei kōrero, A tōia, tōia, tainu i tapotū ki te moana māwai e tō, māku e tō, mā koutou e tō, mā tātou katoa e whakarongoa ke nei tūturu ake te whakamaua kia tīnā, tīnā, haumie, huie, tāke. Kia ora. Nā tēnā kōroe i pono tonu rā ki te... Ki te kaupapa o tēnei hui, ki a hara mai koe i runga i tāua nō mana, wainu e tuatū rā kourua i runga i tā kourua nō mana i runga anō ki te mano o kourua tūpono mātua, nō reira tēnā kourua. They set us something of a challenge whānau, so very few of us probably understood the breadth of that beautiful delivery. Therein lies the challenge. And I think it could be genuinely said, if we really want to understand what Indigenous people and what particularly uh, within the context of this country, Tiwi Māori uh, think uh, about uh, the, the theme of this conference, uh, perhaps um, we might think about uh, attaining some language skills uh, adequate for, for discerning those very messages. Um, so, kia ora kōrua. Ara mai ka mua mua mai ngai iwi nei kia māku wā kōrua kōrua ka mārama, fellas get me in trouble. He'll probably say, oh, we'll have a translation for that afterwards. Well, we shall see. Tēnā kōrua, it gives me much pleasure to welcome following Waimiridangi and Tāmoko, Dewey, who is a litigation lawyer by day and a climate activist by night. After project managing a relief mission in the aftermath of uh, Super Typhoon, uh, the Super Typhoon in the Philippines, uh, Dewey started working on disaster management, climate policy, and <coughs> grassroots campaigning. Uh, she facilitated academic research published by policy briefs, participating at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change COP negotiations. 
uh, sold premium electric vehicles via Tesla and campaigned for zero carbon bill, the zero carbon bill through Generation Zero. As a young lawyer and activist, she is passionate about using her legal skills uh, to properly enforce New Zealand's environmental commitments in court. Kill. Kia ora, my name is Dewey. As Jeremy said, I am a litigation lawyer by day and a climate activist by night. It's a very long day and night, just by the way. I personally started working on climate change in 2013 after super typhoon Haiyan hit my home country, the Philippines. To me, there is no doubt that the root cause of more frequent freak disasters like Haiyan is climate change. From that immersion, I realized that once you know there is something wrong, then you are responsible to make it right. Once again, once you know there is a wrong, you are responsible to make it right. So as a young climate activist, what baffled me when I attended the UN climate talks was that decision makers and key stakeholders in the private sector knew and still know that something radical needs to be done to tackle the climate crisis that we now face. And yet there seemed to be no systemic framework to get climate action happening in New Zealand. So like me, I think that most young people in the room are motivated by our deep need to do the right thing. I mean, this is why we're here, right? Even those who are young at heart. For us, it's in our core to bridge a gap that is so obviously wrong. And in New Zealand's context, that was the lack of a strategy on how we are going to address climate change. So in order to get work done, our generation had to think of what had been done in the past, the limitations of what we can do in the present, and how far we need to extend that to ensure that intergenerational equity um, is ensured for future generations. This is why I'm eternally grateful to the young people in Generation Zero who got to work and lobbied for the Zero Carbon Bill in 2016. I'm so thankful because without the long-term lens of the Zero Carbon Bill, we run the risk of ineffective policies and decisions that prioritize cost avoidance in the short term. Generation Zero took ownership of what our future is going to be like. We campaigned for the solutions that we need and became the critical friend to all the members of parliament and business partners that we need to work with to have a safe climate future. We believe that our generation can fix it. SDG 13 challenges us to make climate change a central focus in all policy decisions that we make. That's because there is no turning back. SDG 13 is also connected to many other goals like clean energy and life on land and on water, to name a few. This means that it's important that we consolidate and collaborate all of our efforts. To maximize the change that we need to make our, for our future, we recognize the value of working in all levels. This is because all levels of society must complement one another to make structural change. So for Generation Zero, we focus on leveraging laws and policies to create a thriving future and affect structural change. So for example, in the international level, we committed to the Paris Agreement and the SDGs but are we really walking the talk on everything that we promised? More importantly, are we including rangatahi um, in the decision-making process? We recognize the need for rangatahi to have a seat in the table to represent the youth's views. Otherwise, how are we supposed to know our place in the world? How can we know that we have the potential to be leaders in addressing climate change? If we truly want to do right by rangatahi, then we need to overhaul the system. We need to rethink the policies and practices that jeopardize our future. This is why Generation Zero's national campaign introduces direction, certainty, and accountability to New Zealand's climate strategy. More importantly, it will also drive a fair and cost-effective transition towards a resilient zero carbon future. One of my most favorite quotes from my activist friends is to think globally and act locally. And we have a tremendous amount of opportunities to act on the local level and even on the school level. Um, I think that most of the students in the room 
um, will agree with me when I say this because I know that if you want to change the world, then you have to start in your schools. My work as an activist has introduced me to many wonderful and youthful souls who are keen to walk the talk. I mean, like, literally. And for example, I once helped the student lobby the bishop um, to start some recycling in their school. And the bishop then helped the students lobby the senior leadership management, sorry, senior management leadership um, to then get some work done. So the students that I've worked with and mentored are some of the most passionate. And if we really want to invest in our future, then we need to invest and empower our youth. So my challenge for everyone here to close is to be a homie to all of our youth. Whether you're a professional, you're a teacher, you're a local counselor, or whether you're Auntie Helen, be a homie to our youth. A homie is an ally who is ready to walk with our youth side by side. A homie is someone who recognizes the injustices that we see, the inequitable future that we will face if we don't get our act together. And more importantly, a homie is a conduit who will help enable the positive change that our rangatahi need. Only in being a homie can we recognize and empower the leaders of our future. Thank you. Following Dewey is Fale Andrew Lesser, uh, and uh, he is a policy consultant at the Asia Development Bank and represents Aotearoa uh, on the UNESCO Asia Pacific Youth Advisory Board. He spent the last 10 years as the elected vice chairman of Manurewa High School and will spend the next six on the Con Conservation Board of New Zealand and the Child and Youth Morality Review Committee. A former city councillor of Manuko. Fale is currently an international advisor for China's Belt and Road Project and a fellow of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He offers a much needed indigenous perspective as a Samoan immigrant. <coughs> Tenatato Katoa. I have the uh, poison chalice of standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to be brief. <laughs> As the only Polynesian on the agenda today, I think it's important that I highlight the unique vulnerabilities of small island developing states in the South Pacific. Growing up in a remote village in Samoa, I saw firsthand just how quickly the climate was changing. Our fishermen were bringing in fewer fish, our water supplies were diminishing, and our farmers were growing crops at a slower level than previously. The sustainable development agenda is a matter of life and death for societies like the SIDS community. We don't have the choice to do something or to do nothing. Our islands are literally sinking. New Zealand became one of the first countries to accept a climate refugee. Because for us, our very livelihoods are embedded in the climate and in the island of our societies. It's rooted in who we are as a people. It's embedded deeply in our DNA. There is no choice when it comes to climate change for Pacific people, which makes it rather sad because we are least responsible for climate change. And yet we are also the least resilient when it comes to managing the effects of climate change because of our size and because of our geographical isolation. And so I call on countries like New Zealand and Australia to act as leaders for the small island developing states in the Pacific who can't stand for themselves, who simply don't have the knowledge and the resources to do it on their own. As leaders in the South Pacific, it is imperative that New Zealand acts for these small islands on their behalf, with them, together. Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, said that you know, the small island developing states are at the heart and soul of our sustainable development agenda, and yet I'm the only Pacific person on the agenda today. That tells us that we're not doing enough for Pacific people and our livelihoods. We're not doing enough as leaders to show the world that the Pacific is fighting and that the Pacific is surviving. Someone said earlier that Auckland is the Polynesian capital of the world. That Samoan is the second most spoken language in Tamaki Makoto after English. 
But what does that mean if we're not leading in the climate justice narrative? If we're not defending the small islands that can't defend themselves on their own? The future belongs to the Pacific and its survival depends on it. But the success or failure of this agenda depends on the engagement of Māori and Polynesian people, on the engagement of Asian New Zealanders. These are the youngest demographics in the country, but they're also the fastest growing demographics in the country. If we leave these groups behind, we won't achieve the goals in time. Ladies and gentlemen, these islands are sinking. And Jacinta Ardern said that climate change was the defining moment of our generation. But it's up to us to decide whether climate change is also the defining moment of our country in the global arena. It could be the nuclear free movement campaign of our generation. Young people are rejecting meat on a scale never seen before. You know it's serious when a fat Samoan is telling people that to eat meat is no longer good for the planet. <laughs> Young people are using public transport and e-scooters because we prefer that to private cars. We're turning away from shopping malls. We're turning away from big homes and appliances that we simply don't need. You see, ladies and gentlemen, young people are already leading on the climate ch change narrative. And so it's about time that we have access to policy, to research, and to the spaces that are conducive to political and economic leadership. I believe the key to the SDG agenda is social transformation. We need to help those who need it the most. We need to engage those who are currently engaged the least. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the key to, to succeeding in the uh, SDG agenda. And I want to end with a Samoan song. I'm not a singer by any stretch of the imagination, so please uh, bear with me as I attempt this pathetic attempt at a song. To my feleni olea uche a I follow le vasa le ali pule meleke ne ingla lo maya pia si ota ele ele I mana tu amai pe. You said you're not much of a singer, but your, your words had much more of a profound effect on us than any great song could have. So thank you very much. Kia ora tato. And here we find the, uh, the questions of the people. Um, so the very first one, what does meaningful youth involvement and consultation look like? I'll start with this because we've done a lot of involvement in the consultation process here in New Zealand, particularly for the Zero Carbon Bill. So I think the core of consultation itself is to actually find out what their views are before the decision happens. And often what happens is the opposite. And so I think that going back to the core of what consultation is, that is the main thing that we need to be better at in Aotearoa in terms of involving the youth. We can't just say, hey, this is option A, B, or C. Which one do you prefer? And that's consultation. That's not it. Before we even get to options A, B, to D, we need to have youth involvement there. And so very simple include us in the decision-making process before consulting us on the decisions that are made. Yeah, I think it's just about having that seat at the table, exactly what you're saying, but instead of coming to you with the options and saying, these are what we think, what do you think? More having that voice at the table in the first place so we can have a say to begin with. 
Thanks. I just want to say quickly that like Jacinda Ardern is one of the youngest leaders in the world. And to build on that, we really do need to kind of revolutionize the way that we co-design with young people. And so it's about not just having us in the room and at the table, but actually co-designing policy and co-designing programs and service providers need to be able to accept that that is the culture of the future, whether we like it or not. Young people are changing the way we do business. And so we should be changing the way that we do government as well. And so you see founders like, you know, the founder of Facebook and the founder of these are young people that are destroying traditional industries by simply having an idea. And so imagine the kind of potential we would have if you had young people in government, on these government boards, designing policy with the adults in the room together. I think that is the potential for young people in decision making. Absolutely. Um, I think there's some, sort of some three key points here. One is that you've got to have people at the table from the beginning, like you said. And when they're at the table, they need to feel valued. They need to know that their ideas and their contributions are going to be listened to and incorporated. Too often, youth consultation is just tick boxes. It's just a process that you do to fulfill a requirement that someone else has told you to do. And so when young people know that they don't feel valued, that's a huge, huge impact on their well-being, but also their ability to meaningfully contribute to those discussions. And their presence needs to be valued. I, ha I, know, I have a friend who is on a board. She's the youth representative, and she manages an entire other youth group as part of that um, board. She's the only board member not paid. Um, and so you need to value your youth representatives as much as you would value an adult. Um, their contributions are just as insightful, just as relevant, and that you should respect that just as you would respect any other adult in that place. One other question. Um, I think you, you marvellously covered uh, the uh, the theme of a number of the, the, the higher questions further up the up the poll here. But um, perhaps this one: um, uh, the least responsible, least resilient, are most affected by climate change. But how can we ensure a socially just transition away from cheaper goods and energy? That sounds like a question for me. <laughs> One of the great examples is Tuvalu that has gone completely off the grid when it comes to energy. And that's an example for the rest of the Pacific to follow through with. You know, this idea that we are small enough to be radical in the way that we embrace renewable energy and that we could be an example to the rest of the world simply by having the, um, the right kind of characteristics for renewable energy to take off. Uh, but what we do need desperately is the international investment. And so I think that that is the role that Australia and New Zealand are already playing and could be playing uh, going forward as well. Um, Tēnei o ngā pātou e hāngai pūmau ana ki āhau. Tēnei āhua tanga o te hurihanga o te āhua arangi. Me pēhea ōku rangatai ōku teina e whakaro ake mō wēnei mōmō āhua tanga te noho ki wānganui i wēnei wāhi ina ko te kai te aronga tuatahi, ina ko te kura te aronga tuatahi, ina ko te whānau te aronga tuatahi. Te taia e ōku whānau e ōku teina te whakaro ake mō wēnei āhua tanga te āhua nei he tino nui Nā, nā runga i ngā āhuatanga o roto i o rātou ake whānau, te taru-taru, te waipiro. Wera āhuatanga katoa, te taia oku rangatahi, te titiro ki tēnei o ngā paiwhiri, o ngā paikōrero. E rua noi ho māua he Māori. Kei autea roa mātou. E rua rua e toru-toru noi ho mātou, e whaka... E whaka Hua ana i wenei o a mātou nawe o a mātou raru ki wānga ki tēnei āhuatanga. Ko te tai au tō mātou ukaipo, ko te tai au tō mātou tuāpapa. E rangi e rua noi ho ngā reo e kōrero nei. Hei, hei, hei kanohi mō tātou te rangatai. So koira tētahi o ngā whakārotanga. Me pēhia mātou e whaka awe awe i wā mātou rangatahi, te whai ai i te mātou ranga, Te whae ngā āhuatanga tautoko i wa rātou whānau, tae ai rātou te whakaaro ake mō wēnei mō mō nawe. Kia ora tātou. Um, thank you once again to... Uh, some might assume that they're, they're here as our youth representatives, but they're, they're experts in their own right in spite of their youth. Um, and so um, for perhaps uh, providing us with um, the, the, the impetus we need to move into um, to lunch and, and giving us um, much food for thought as we both uh, rejuvenate physically. Um,
and spiritually and intellectually. Um, we thank you also uh, for allowing us to have you here this afternoon and for being able to thank you for your contributions this afternoon via this wonderful initiative, uh, that being the e-certificate and, um, and the uh, project that it is supporting. Uh, thank you also to Victoria, our chair. Victoria, do, as, as chair, um, because of the way we kind of ran things, are there, are there any final points you'd like to offer as, as chair of this, this afternoon's wonderful session? Um, yeah, Rangatahi are eager, they're passionate, they're motivated, they want to be involved. They're already leading across society. As organisations and representatives here, you need to reflect the way that you look at diversity in your organisations and you need to include young people in that and look at your barriers, your biases in that and how do you remove that to make those pathways and those processes more accessible for young people to be there, to hold space and to co-design things with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And, uh, Uh, and uh, before we do break for lunch, uh, I'm going to invite either um, Waimirirangi or Tamoko to offer our karakia to bless our food. Kwa ki te rā, hau i rungi te pukumate he, he tangata nana ki a kōrua mo te whakatupu kai. Uh, ko kōrua rā, te, te reo o te whenua, te reo o pokatuanu, ku te reo uh, o, 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 o te rangi. Hoeno e tikanu ki a riru ma te tahi o kōrua uh, wā tātou kai e whakapai. Uh, I see on Facebook these two all the time. Um, digging in the earth and growing these, um, these amazing looking vegetables, not the kind that you'll find in, in shops or, or, or supermarkets these days. So as, as the, the, the voice of the land and as, and as two people well acquainted with the land, uh, I'll ask one of them to come forward and, and offer us a karakia to bless our food before we break this afternoon. <coughs> A uh, katika a uh, ka fakaro ake mata ki ngā hua o ngā mana atu a irunga i tēnei wā a uh, mo ngā kai kai te hora nei ki mui o tō tātou aro o nei ira ki a inu e tātou nau mai e ngā hua nau mai e ngā kai o te wā o te ngā kina o te waitai o te wā ma, o te wai Māori a uh, nā tāni nā rongo nā haumi e nā tangaroa nā maru ko rangi nui e tui ho nei ko papatua nu ko e takoto ake nei tūturu a o kiti whakamau ake a tina tina haumi e hui e tai ki e e kai <laughs>